just all raise our hands and give our all to God. Even if we don't feel like doing it, let's just raise our hands in reverence to our Lord. I 
for this service and us being able to come together and worship and bow in reverence of our God. To him, it means so much more than just a service. It's our lives given to him, us committing to our Lord, Father, God. So today, as we listen to the message, let's think about in the ways that God has moved in our lives and how we want him to move in our lives, how we want him to change our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for that. All right, I'm going to introduce our speaker for tonight. Um, our speaker tonight is David Hughes. He is our ninth grade guys leader. So if you guys wanna give it up for David. We are super excited to have him here. Um, I've kind of been giving this little spiel the past few weeks as we've been in this series, but we are talking about forgiveness, and forgiveness can be a heavy topic. So we are asking that if you guys have to get up and go to the bathroom, you guys wait till the end of the service. We get it. If you have to go, go. But we are asking that you guys hold on getting up during the service. So give it up for David. One more time. Hey, everybody. Thank you guys so much. I'm excited, and uh, I just love doing this kind of stuff because I love God, and this is just an expression of how one way I can show God that I love him is just talking about him and his word, and it's going to be awesome. So I'm excited. Like you said, I'm the ninth grade boys, uh, small group leader. I've only been around for a few months now, so, uh, but that's who I am. I just got my badge like a couple weeks ago, though, so I haven't been official. Until then, so anyway. All right. So, uh, Amy, thanks for lowering this for me and then having to put it back up. Come on. All right. So, the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about forgiveness, right? And one of the main things that I've gotten out of it is forgiveness is a lot more for our sake than the person we might be forgiving or the situation that we might need to be offering forgiveness for. And that's important because tonight we're going to talk about forgiving God, holding a grudge against God. Now, I want to be real clear here because God technically doesn't ever really need our forgiveness because God doesn't sin. So as far as God's actions are concerned, he never requires our forgiveness. But sometimes there's circumstances, there's things that happen in our life, as you've heard over the past couple of weeks. There's heavy circumstances, circumstances that happen in our life where sometimes we're holding something against God. And it's a process we need to go through. So that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. So why do we find ourselves holding something against God? What are some situations that he didn't come through when you asked him to or when you expected him to? So maybe it was like, God, I'd really like to be taller. And then I could slam dunk, you know, or whatever, right? God, take this acne away. It's just a natural part of growing up, all right? Don't worry. Or maybe it's something a little heavier. Uh, maybe it's God can mom or dad please come home. Maybe it's God, uh, this person that I love is really sick. Can you heal them? God, I have depression. I'm always anxious, and I just wish you could, can you just take it from me, God? Take it from me. I know you want to. I know you're good. Can you just take that from me? And this is the real things that, that happen. So what do we do when we don't get the answer we expect, or we don't get an answer at all? Sometimes that makes us wrestle with God and hold something against him. So uh, as I was preparing for this, I, uh, I actually lost two friends in the same week, passed away. And they were relatively close to my age. Um, this is stuff that happens in real life, and it's really easy to say, why, God? Why? But here's what we're going to talk about. Even in difficulty, God still deserves our worship. All right, so 
when we're in these situations, they cause us to wrestle with feelings. Maybe we have doubt, maybe we have confusion, maybe we have anger, and we're directing these things at God. So what's an appropriate response when we're wrestling with God? God already proved his love for us, right? John 3.16, probably one of the most popular Bible verses, right? What does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, whoever believes in him shall have eternal lasting life. God already proved his love for us through Jesus Christ dying for us. So our response to that is worshiping him even in difficulty. Okay? So let's hear about a person who had to go through this process. All right? Let's talk about Job. Uh, So I don't know how many of you have heard of Job. It's spelled J-O-B like job, but it's pronounced Job-A-I. I I don't know. You guys remember Hag-A-I? I'm just just a joke against Amy. (laughs) Please hold your laughter till the end. Okay, Job. So let's set it up. There's, it's the book opens and it's talking about God in heaven and it says there's angels around him and Satan comes. And God's like, hey, Satan, have you seen my boy Job, right? So let's talk about it. Job 1.8. He says, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. He's blameless and upright man who fears God and shuns evil. So God's like, look at my boy. I'm real proud of him. He does it right. And Satan goes and he says, listen, God, he's just like that because you bless him so much. If you, if he had lost those things, if you weren't blessing him so much, he wouldn't be like that. Okay. So in Job 1.12, God says, the Lord said to Satan, okay, fine. Very well then. Everything he has is in your power, but the man himself don't lay a finger on him. Okay. So basically God says, all right, I give you permission to mess with him and wreck his life. Just don't touch him, okay? So Job is living the dream. He's got seven sons, three daughters, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, 500 donkeys, and a lot of servants under his household, okay? So he's living the dream, right? Like, I don't know what I would do if I had that many camels, man. I'd be living right, okay? But he loses everything, okay? There's this... This, this part where in, in the book of Job where somebody, a servant comes running up to him and he says, Job, your whole family was having a feast at your son's house and a wind came and it blew the house down. Everybody died except for me. And the Bible says, while he was still talking, another servant came and said, all your camels are dead. And, uh, and as they were still talking, another servant came and all your, your sheep are dead and, and everything, oxen, donkeys, servants, everybody, family gone. His life is falling apart. And in in one moment, he lost everything. So what is his response to this? I know what my response would be. And it wouldn't be what Job's was. But let's see. He never blamed God. In Job 120 uh, through 22, it says, at this, Job got up tore his robe off, shaved his head. That's just how they did it back then, right? And he fell to the ground in worship. Now, how many of us in the middle of just hearing that everybody we loved died and everything that we hold dear and own is gone would get on our knees and say, you know what, God? You deserve worship right now. I don't, you know, I just don't, I don't think I'd be able to do that And this is what he said. Naked I came from my mother's room and naked I'll depart. The Lord Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. So then Satan goes back to God and he says, okay, okay, fine. He still worshiped you then, but now let me mess with him, the actual person. So then God says, fine, you can mess with Job his body. Okay. So then Satan causes all these boils to get all over Job's body. And in a moment, not only is this world falling apart, but now his body's falling apart. But even in difficulty, he knew God still deserves our worship. At least he had a super encouraging wife. You know, Uh, we always have those people that stick with us, man. His wife, Job 2, 9, it says, his wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. Isn't that so encouraging? 
Man, I'm glad my wife ain't like that. He says, are you still, are you still praising God? Just die already. The love of a wife. All right. So, Job isn't perfect. Job, Job. I just said it wrong. Job isn't perfect, okay? He's not perfect. Yes, he's blameless. He didn't do anything to deserve all this happening to him. But he's not perfect. He's just a man. And that's good because we need to be able to relate to that because none of us are perfect. So, in the whole chapter of Job 3, basically, it's him just unloading on God. Why me? Why is this happening? And he, he curses the day he was born. He just talks about, man, may that day just be cursed. I wish it never happened. I wish I was never born because then I'd never be feeling this. You know, I don't know how many of you have ever felt like that before. But I know I've been through some pretty dark times saying, man, I wish. It would be better if I wasn't even born because then I wouldn't feel this way. So, uh, I got a little original meme I made here. Even through all of this, Job, let's see, let's see that. Get that. So here we go. This is an original. So Job's like, do everything right, lose everything anyway. No, he doesn't. He's not like that. He unloads on God. So, but luckily, even though his wife is just telling him to go ahead and die already, he's got some great friends. And his friends hear that Job's going through a hard time, and they're like, man, we need to go see Job. We need to go help him feel better. So, we got Eliphaz the Temanite. These guys got some pretty epic names. I'm going to name my kids after these guys. I'm just kidding. So what does Eliphaz the Temanite have to say? Job 4, 7. Consider now who being innocent has ever perished. Where were the upright ever destroyed? As I've observed, those who plow evil and those who sow trouble reap it. And later in Job 5, 17, he says, Blessed is the one whom God corrects, so don't despise the discipline of the Almighty. Basically, what he's trying to tell Job here is you must have done something wrong to deserve this. Because God only does this to people who deserve it. Okay? Great friend, right? So they're like, Job, just fess up, man. You know you did something wrong. But we know, we know from the beginning of the story, God tells us that Job hasn't done anything to deserve this, all right? So what does his next homeboy tell him? Bildad from Shua. He said in Job 8, 1 through 4, Bildad from Shua was next to speak, and he said, how can you keep talking like this? Because this whole time Job's like saying, Job's saying, hey, listen, I haven't done anything to deserve this, all right? I'm just, I'm just being cursed. I'm just, everything's falling apart. So Bildad, he says, how can you keep talking like this? You're talking nonsense and the noise and noisy nonsense at that. He's just like, blah, 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 right? Does God mess up? Does God Almighty ever get things backwards? It's plain that your children sinned against him. Otherwise, why would he have punished them? And this is, this is from the message version, okay? So I like it because it just puts it in, in some simpler terms. And here's the dangerous part. Here's the dangerous part about Bill Dad's advice. There's, there's some truth in it, right? Like God is always right. He's always correct. So he brings up an interesting point. Hey, God doesn't mess up. So if God did this to you, it must have been for a reason. Again, coming back to you're wrong somehow, you just don't want to admit it. But we know that's not what's going on here. Job doesn't know it. His friends don't know it, but we get to see that. All right? So then we get to Zophar from Namath. It says, how I wish God would give you a piece of his mind and tell you what's what. I wish he'd show you how wisdom looks like from the inside. Real or true wisdom is mostly inside. But you can be sure of this. You haven't even gotten half of what you deserve. So they're convinced. Job, I know what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. But all of this evidence tells us something different. Right? It's a good thing God has these guys to stick up for him, huh? These guys know God, right? So they, they know God's mind. So it's a good thing God has these guys to tell Job and set him straight, right? No. No. So for several chapters, Job defends himself. They argue back and forth. They're saying, Job, you messed up. Just admit it. And he's like, guys, this ain't helping, <laughs> right? So here is Job's response. Okay, we're going to skip to Job chapter 23. Here's his response. Even when he doesn't feel God, when he doesn't see God, 
he still knows the process he has to go through. He still knows that he needs to stay faithful. He says, I go east, but he is not there. God is he. I go west, but I can't find him. I don't see him in the north, for he's hidden. I look to the south, but he's concealed. But he knows where I'm going, and he tests me, and I will come out pure as gold. For I've stayed on God's paths. I've followed his ways and not turned aside. I've not departed from his commands, but have treasured his words more than daily food, even in difficulty. God still deserves our worship. Through all the noise, Job is clear on one thing. He's not clear why this is happening. He's not clear where his life's going to end up. In fact, he just wishes he was gone, but he's clear on one thing. During difficulty, God still deserves our worship. So the whole time, Job says, all he wants is a chance to plead his case before God. God, why is this going on? Why is this happening? So God shows up. Okay. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with, with the times in the Bible that God shows up, but people usually are pretty scared because it's the creator of the universe showing up. So this is what God says to Job in Job 38. Brace yourself like a man. I'm going to question you, and you're going to answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand So Job is having his pity party. He's saying, why me? God, why are you doing this to me? And God shows up and says, be a man. Stand before me. Who do you think you are? And what's the importance of this? God takes Job through a lot of creation. He says, look at this animal. Look at that animal. Can you make them do that? Can you make the snow fall from the sky? Can you make the deer pant for water? Can you just, all all this creation that God set up, the complexity of this earth and all creation that God set up with just words, just speaking it into existence. And he says, Job, can you do that? And Job has to admit, no, I'm wrong. And here's the best part. Job never gets an answer. Job never hears from God. God never explains. Job, this is why I did it. You were just this pawn in this divine experiment between me and Satan. He never gets his answer. He never gets his why. All God says is that I am the God of the universe. And therefore, he still deserves our worship. And there's times we go, we don't get our questions answered. We're going through a tough time. We don't know why we're going through it. But God still has designed for that. And even in difficulty, God still deserves our worship. Okay, so you say, I get it. This guy, Job, he lived thousands of years ago. He was, God said he was really great, but I'm not Job. You know, is there anybody... Recently, in the last thousand years, that's even been able to do this. Well, let me tell you a story. I want to tell you a story about Ashley. Okay? We got a picture of Ashley. And when Ashley uh, was 19 years old, she got married. And two and a half months after she got married, her husband was killed on his motorcycle by a drunk driver. Now, that's something that would cause most of us to ask God why. She had a lot of questions. She had a lot of disappointment because she felt God told her, you are going to have a ministry. And she had prayed about her children from a very young age, from a teenager, your guys' age, okay? 19 is not that far off from where a lot of you are. She prayed and she felt God say, uh, I'm going to give you a daughter, and, and her name's going to be Selah. Okay? So she had all these questions. Why? What about Selah? What about ministry? What about all these things that I felt? And this is what her response was. She knew during difficulty, God still deserves our worship. And this even includes forgiving the man, radically forgiving the man that killed her husband. Okay? So 
Delays are not denials. And even when we don't see God doing anything, it doesn't mean he's not doing something. Let me tell you why I know so much about Ashley. She's my wife. So I've been married to her for 13 years now. And that's Selah right there. So she realized if she held a grudge against God, she would never realize what God had for her. And she also runs her own ministry that ministers to other widows. So when we have the right mindset, when we know that no matter what we're going through, our process is to worship God, then we can still live in the blessings. And, and a follow-up to Job, if you read the end, it says that Job was more blessed in the second half of his life than in the first half of his life. So, just as forgiveness of others is an act of faith, worshiping God in the middle of our difficulty is an act of faith. And God would rather have us express our anger at him than totally walk away. So, this is what I'd like us to do. All right? Worshiping God can look a lot of different ways. All right? Tonight, it might look like pouring your heart out for a song. All right? Other times, it looks like loving the people around us well. Maybe especially those that aren't very easy to love. Sometimes it looks like getting together with other people who love Jesus and serving others. Sometimes it looks like doing your best at school or doing your best at work because you're doing it for him. Those are all ways that we can worship God. But whatever it looks like, just remember, even in difficulty, he still deserves our worship. So even when we don't feel it, we could still choose to believe it. So right now... Let's worship. A lot of us wonder why we're not like Job, why we don't have the faith that Job had, or why we're not as much as Jesus like Jesus as we want to be and the truth is we're not any of those people we're not Job we're not Joseph we're not David we're who God says we are and if you guys have your communion we'll do communion right now um but I just want to say that nobody is, will ever be ready to take communion nobody deserves communion but Christ and Jesus, Christ Jesus and God gave us the opportunity to be accepted, to be adopted into a family of higher being, of higher worth. He gave us our worth. He gave us who we are. He gave us who he wants us to be. So as you take communion, I just want you guys to think about how God has moved in your life, why you believe in God, well, who you believe God says you are. So we're going to sing a song called Another in the Fire. So when you guys are done with communion, um, just lift your hands, close your eyes, and really listen to the words, sing the words, and worship to your King.
Well, that's the end of the service. <laughs> Hope you guys enjoyed. Um, you are dismissed to groups.